Hello there and welcome to the video. I'm Fide Master Ingvar Johannesson from Iceland. And in this video we're going to explore a little bit, uh, you know, about the past, about the old masters, what we can learn from them and how we perhaps should respect them more than we do. Anyway, uh, sort of the key point or the key moment that uh, ignited my passion for this particular topic was uh, a pivotal game at the European uh, Team Championship between Ali Reza Ferusha and Shakhri Mamdiarov. Now, Ali Reza managed to win this game, and this game almost propelled France to the gold medal, but at the end of the day Ukraine won the gold because of uh, tie breaks. But this particular position that we have on the board here was uh, one that made the rounds so to say, uh, in internet circles. Because this is where Mamdiarov uh, blundered the game away. He played king to d4. It turns out that the only drawing move is to play rook to f3. A difficult move to see in some cases, because you have to uh, assess the king and pawn and game that arises. But let's see what happened in, in uh, Ali Reza against uh, Mamdiarov first. Mamdiarov played king to d4, king g2 by Ali Reza. And now after king h3, it turns out uh, black is in trouble because the king is going to get a good position. Either it gets to a4 if we try to check, or we manage to push the pawn. In the game after king e5, Ali Reza pushed the pawn, and now it's just game over. For instance, if you start checking, I'm going to play here. I'm threatening to push the pawn, so you kind of have to go rook g7 not to allow me to push the pawn, intending if I go here to check again, but if you go rook g7, I have move rook f5, and then king f4, and uh, just eventually I'm going to pick up this pawn. Maybe rook g5 next move, and then pick up the pawn. So, simply no stop in the g-pawn. Um, in Mamedyarov's defense, uh, I think he didn't have a lot of time. And back, back in the day, the old masters, you know, they tended to have more time, perhaps, in, in, in similar positions. And it turns out that this exact position occurred in a game in 1908 in Prague. And with the white pieces, we had Richard Tachmann, and with the black pieces, uh, Simeon Alapin. And, well, well over a hundred years ago, Alapin found the correct defense. He played rook f3. And he was able to grasp the position and understand you know, what he had to do. And what he has to do is to keep pressure on this f2 pawn. And not allow the king to get activated, like in the game Ali Reza against Mamdiarov. So, let's first have a look at the... Uh, Pawn and game. If what well, takes on f3 and tries to you know get the king out, we play king e4 and we meet. Uh, we just hit, hit them with the opposition. It comes here. Uh, I'm trying to make a new color here. Yeah, we come here. For instance, king d2, king d4. And we can't walk the other way because uh, we need to go very far to get out of the reach of the pawn. This is what I call, you know, the dart or the arrow. When this arrow makes the square, the king is in the square. So once we start running with a G pawn, it turns out that uh, you know we can give away the G pawn, but whenever we're in the F pawn, we we lose the uh, opposition and it's a draw. So let's have a look at some other tries. Rook here. This is what happened in the game. Uh, Tachman played rook e8, king d4 by Alapin. And he just kept the king around and put the pressure on the f2 pawn. So now you can't activate the king, and that's the key. And if you play g4, you play rook f3. So if I were to play g4 here, you play rook here. And again, the king can't activate, and that's the important thing. And eventually, either you, uh, you allow the black king to get back to the pawn, or you allow you know, the pawn to, to push a little bit too far, and then you have a check. And the rook gets behind the pawn, we win the pawn, and then we draw the game. So 
to run the game, row T2. And I checked this with, uh, with uh, the table pieces. And Alapin never made a mistake here with black pieces. Just kept the pressure on the F pawn. Now he switched over to the third rank. He's not going to allow this king to be activated. So don't allow the king to be activated in the rook game. Important concept and Alapin had no problem with that concept. You know, kept the rook on the third. Now finally we see g4. And now you'll see what I'm, I was talking about. You know, the king, okay. At the moment it's caught up on the f-file. But the, the key thing is we don't allow the white king to get activated. And eventually there's no way for white to, to really improve the position. And here a draw was agreed. So as you can see, same position over a 100 years, uh, over 100 years between the games. But the old game, Alapin found the defense, but Mamed Yarov didn't. Now, is Alapin a better player than Mamed Yarov? I highly doubt that. Mamed Yarov is a fantastic player, one of the best we have today. I mean, he's been world number two, super talented guy. I'm just showing you that, you know, the guys in the past, you know, they, they, they found some good moves. Now, at the European team championship Iceland was playing unfortunately I couldn't go as captain because I had COVID apparently well I had a positive test but I had no no symptoms but I couldn't go to Slovenia which was uh, unfortunate nonetheless I was able to do commentary here in Iceland and during one of our matches against Finland our board won our board won uh, Hjörvar Ketterson he played this game he had the white pieces against Mikhail Akapov of Finland at b3 and well quiet opening double fianchetto and we reach this position castles e3 and bishop to g4 now here sort of is where white's you know problem started i mean queen d3 is not a bad move but it's a move that that Hjorva made and in the game after bishop takes f3 knight to g5 hitting the bishop Hjorva took on g6 played f4 96 by Akapov and it turned out that the pressure on d4 was very difficult and the pin here on the long diagonal is also very difficult Akapov took on d4 and played c5 utilizing the pin and here he was able to break in the center with d5 and this is much better for black uh, I think computer has this like min minus one point something and Hero thought it was so bad that in fact he desperately went for a peace sacrifice here that did not work out. It was an interesting game, but that's sort of not the, the you know the topic of the video. Black won the game. But the problem sort of started with uh, the move Queen to D3. Now after the game, I got a phone call from well one of the legends of Icelandic chess, Frederik Olason. Now if you don't know who he is, um, well, he made the candidates in 1959. He beat Tal, Fischer, Karpov, Petrosian, basically everybody during his his, uh, his peak years. I even have a video where uh, he explains his win against Tal, and I encourage you to check that out. I'll, I'll leave a link to that. But okay, he, he gave me a call and he said, you know, the game that, that Hero played today, I had the same position many years ago. I think it was 1960. Okay, I think I might have it here. Uh, 1967 in Dundee and this he remembered trust me he doesn't have a database you know he just saw the position he remembered hey I had this position against Grigoric I remember remember he's turning 86 in January his memory is phenomenal I think that's what sets a lot of you know great players like this apart you know they can remember their old games and you know draw from ideas so okay you remember the uh, the other game is start with b3 so we have a different move order here, but we end up in the same situation. The top of Fiancero, and we get the same position. Bishop g4. But here the difference is that Frederick played the better move, queen to c2. And like he explained to me, the reason is quite simple. Uh, the queen of c2 keeps an eye on the bishop on b2. And this eliminates a lot of the tactical problems that uh, 
White ended up having in the other game with the pressure on d4 and, and the long diagonal. So the game, uh, Olofsson against Glikoric, continued bishop takes f3, knight g5. Same as the other one, took on c6. But now the difference is because the bishop is not hanging, we can take on c5. And that's what Frederick did, took on c5, takes, queen takes, d takes c5. And white is better. You know, these pawns are, are isolated, they have no dynamics. And if white, you know, holds his cards correctly, he can put some pressure. It should be better. I mean, it's by no means winning, but a better position. You know, we discussed it a little bit more and he agreed, you know, he, he uh, could have played better, I think, on like the 19th move of the game. And if, if he had done so, you know, he, he would have kept up the pressure. But the consensus is that this is, this is better for white. Um, modern engines kind of agree. Queen c2 is the second best move. But for some reason, uh, Stockfish prefers queen to c1 and says white is much better. Now, I haven't been able to figure out, honestly, the, the difference between queen c2 and, and queen c1. There must be some difference in some variation, but I haven't really you know, sat down to an, analyze the difference. But in any case, keeping an eye on the bishop on b2 gives white the better chances. So again, we have a game with, uh, well, over 50 years this time, and in the older game, same position. The old master made a better decision than the modern GM. Lo and behold, later in the European Team Championship, I get another phone call because of this position. And let's go back a few moves. This was a King's Indian, where uh, Johan Hjartarsson, uh, another Icelandic legend, who played on the uh, Icelandic team this year. He had the white pieces against uh, a young guy from Macedonia. They played this Kings in the uh, variation and, uh, and black played f6, which is the best move. Queen d2, rook takes h3, take on g5, and rook f4. A very interesting uh, sacrifice of the exchange. Johan played rook g3, and we'll get back to this king. Again, I get a phone call from the 85-year-old legend, and, and he was like, well, well, they just keep playing, uh, you know, positions I used to play in the past. Uh, I had this position against Raymond Keane in 1976. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm just so impressed because he doesn't have a database. He just remembers these positions. I've, I, I've, witnessed, I've witnessed this so many times, and it's, you know, it never ceases to amaze me. So, you know, he had this position against Ray Keane uh, at the Reykjavik Open in 1976. Same position. And he said, you know, during the game, I was really worried about this move, f6. And he mentions all this in his... Uh, one of the most famous chess books in Icelandic is, is a book about his, you know, most successful uh, attacking games, and this is one of them. And, you know, all the notes are there, they, they talk about this. He was worried about the move f6 because of this exchange sacrifice on f4. In the game against Keane, he actually, Keane played c6, which was not as good, and Frederick ended up winning, well, relatively easily. I mean, what is much better here, and uh, he was able to, to, uh, to win the game. Again, which is not the point of the video to analyze this game, but you know, to have a look at these, these decisions. So he was worried about this move, f6. After the game, he told Raymond Keane about this. He said, you know, I think f6 was, was interesting. And you have this you know, exchange sacrifice on f4. Later, in that same tournament in 1976, Raymond Keane again gets the black pieces. Lo and behold, he gets the same position. After queen d2, now he played the move f6. And he used the idea that Friedrich mentioned in, in the postmortem against another Icelander. And what happened was knight h3, takes takes, take on g5, and rook f4. He sacked the exchange. The Icelander took it, and black got excellent compensation. He took on g5, hitting the rook, followed by queen f6. And then rerouted the knight to e5, and black has an excellent position. Great dark sword bishop, great long diagonal here. Fantastic knights. And most importantly, you know, 
blockade on some of white's main pieces here. The bishop doesn't have a lot of scope, the knight doesn't have a lot of squares. This pressure is, is kind of useless because of the knight. So a great position for black, but Keen was not able to convert. So this shows that, you know, again, back in 1976, same position. I think this time around, though, Hjartarsson was aware of the situation. And in fact, modern computers prefer white after rook g3. But they don't want to take the exchange, which is what Hjartarsson did. He took the exchange. And I think, you know, black always gets great practical compensation uh, on a dark squares and with, with his blockade and well after a complicated game you know it's not by, by any means over but it was a complicated game and Johan ended up gambling on uh, the long diagonal he wanted to get counterplay on the king side and gambled on the long diagonal and black was able to break through in the end and win the game so like all of us said many years ago this idea with f6 is really really dangerous so this was sort of uh you know i wrote you know a short a short uh, blog post on, on icelandic uh, chess media about this which uh, was well received and this prompted me to uh well analyze you know some games and and, and stuff uh for a lecture here uh, at my chess club and my next few videos will be you know the games that uh I sort of touch on this subject, subject a little bit, you know, how we draw up on the, you know, knowledge from the old games and sometimes, you know, how the old masters, you know, weren't, weren't all that bad and perhaps we should respect them a little bit more. Nonetheless, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed uh, my rambling here about, you know, these positions and hope to see you soon in another chess video. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.